Masters World Champion John Baldwin from Scotts Valley, California. I think you guys will enjoy this. John is a great competitor, a great sportsman, and we thank him for coming out tonight. Thanks, enjoy John. Yourself. How about a round of applause for Twisted Flyer? And Joe? because uh, he was very generous in helping me get out here with some airfare, so that was nice. How are you guys doing tonight? Good. So, a uh, few things I want to talk about, a few things that you guys want me to talk about. Um, something I was going to start with was sort of uh, that we're all kind of a member of the disc golf community, and if you guys are here, you're kind of expressing that you're pretty serious about the game and you want it to improve, or you want to improve your own game. And I think it's, uh, it's kind of important for us all to be stewards of the game. When we're out there playing, if you see trash on the ground or if you see someone who needs some help with their game, offer it to them. Be welcoming and help grow the sport by putting a good face on the sport. Keeping the park clean. Joe says that there's some trouble with litter around some of these courses. So it's a good idea for us all to kind of pitch in and be a good example for everyone else so that the sport can uh, grow and be a good good thing for all the communities that it goes into, which it usually is a good thing. Um, so along those lines, uh, courtesy when you're playing with a, with a group of people, I think is pretty important because um, we all played with players who sometimes will kick their bags or they'll get frustrated, they'll get angry. And a lot of times the other people in the group can't really have a good time when that happens. So. We all kind of mentally try to remember that we affect the others around us and to try to be positive. I think that'll help a lot. Um, so some things that I think I'm kind of known for in the game are being kind of cool and collected and not really getting too elevated with my emotions. And uh, it's, it's something that comes naturally to me, but I see that it does really help to be that way in the game because if you hit a tree or you, you throw a shot and it ends up bad and you get all angry and you kick your bag, you know, think, you know, what is it that you're really angry about when you do that? It, you know, because that tree that you hit was there long before you ever picked up a disc and it probably doesn't really deserve to have your anger thrown upon it because you hit it. So I think personal responsibility about your game and your shots you know, don't look to blame other people. I, I played with Steve Rico um, in one of my first pro tournaments, and he kind of had a reputation as being sort of a hothead. And when I found, when I played with him, I didn't find that was true at all. I mean, if he had a bad shot, he'd get a little angry. But I was kind of nervous about, you know, being in his line, having the proper etiquette when I played with him. And I apologized to him once, and he said, you know. You can do whatever you want because it's all up to me before I throw my shot. So he, he took personal responsibility for his actions and those people around him and how it affected his game. He wasn't quick to blame someone else. So if you kind of like, you know, just realize that you are in control of your own shots and your own destiny on the course, that'll get you to a point where you can learn the game and, and kind of see where your weaknesses are instead of blaming them. That's a good attitude to try to carry with you on the course. Um, getting really upset, I don't really think too many people play better when they're mad. I think some people do, but try to keep a cool head and realize, hey, it's our, our worst day of disc golf is probably a lot better than our you know, best day of work. So be thankful for uh, being out there and having the time to enjoy this great sport. Um, any questions about the mental game or anything like that? Okay. So, uh, you guys have probably all figured out that to shoot a good score, you've got to putt well. And putting's one of the, probably the simplest things. There's not a lot of complex, you know, I don't know, there's, there's not a lot of details that uh, you can get caught up with. Anyone can really, you know, make a putt. But there are fundamentals that are important that I think for everyone's putt, no matter what kind of style they choose. And probably the biggest fundamental I see in putting is you want to have a good weight transfer when you putt. Because the more you can use your legs to propel the disc, the less your, your 
shoulder and your wrist, which are really, you know, they're joints that have a lot of range of motion, so they introduce a lot of um, inconsistency in the flight if you don't get them right every time. So if you if you build your putt on a base of sort of moving your center of gravity forward every time, it gives you a lot of energy and you don't really even have to use your arm very much at all if your weight is transferring forward towards the basket. And that's really what the, the pros and, and everyone who does jump putts, that's really what they're doing is they're making sure that their body is going straight towards the basket and they're using that power so they don't have to use as much of their arm. So if, you know, if you're outside of 10 meters and you want to jump butt, you can, you can do it without really using that much of your arm and be much more consistent with your legs. Now, I'm, I'm not from Oklahoma, so I'm not used to this wind. But uh, I do try to always start off by sort of like zeroing out my body and I line it right at the pole and then I kind of like lean forward because it's a lot easier to make a putt if you're closer to the basket. And I feel like if I lean forward, this is a lot closer than if I'm back here. So I always kind of plan my release to be up forward. And then transferring that weight from front to back and pick a spot on the basket or even through the basket. I think sometimes if you can pick a spot that's past the basket, it'll help with putts that come up short. Because a lot of times if you focus on the basket and you're a little short, it's just gonna hit the cage and you're gonna be frustrated. But if you pick a spot that's either behind, like sometimes I'll look at the chains that are on the back side of the basket, just to help me get forward momentum. Get, make sure that I don't hit the tray because we all know what that's like. Hitting the tray is kind of like really frustrating. <laughs> um, and coming from Santa Cruz, we don't, we don't really have that many greens that are flat like this. We have a lot of greens that have slopes that go into canyons. And so I developed my putt to basically make sure that I don't miss the next putt. I don't ever want to rifle a putt so far that I have an even longer putt the next time. So you'll see, like compared to a lot of people out here, I kind of have a more optic kind of putt because I want to make sure I stay close to the basket. Um, but I didn't learn to putt in the wind, but I learned that I had to learn how to putt in the wind. So when I do, I, I do what's called, I think most people would call it a spin putt, and I kind of align the disc up here, and it's really just a, from my chest to an extension like this. And what it does is it keeps the disc level into the wind instead of a nose up or a nose down, and it tends to glide and not really have much up or down. So if you get it aligned just right, when you get in the motion or in the groove, it works really well. And I've noticed in the wind, a lot of people are afraid of having the nose come up and go beyond the basket too far. And I've learned to become a little less fearful of that because if you do, if you're aggressive and you don't go too far, you keep it relatively close to the basket, then you have a tailwind putt coming back. And I think tailwind putts are a lot easier because they're just a matter of, you almost like treat it just like a weight. If you were to throw a softball or a baseball, how would you throw it? You might just, you know, basically pitch it right in there. And that's kind of how I like to uh, make sure that I don't give away too many strokes in my putting game. Any questions on that or any more detail you'd like me to go into? Do you jump out at all? I do. Particularly outside of uh, 10 meters, I will, um, I'll do a step part, um, which is something I'm just incorporating on in my game now. I've played with so many people who, can, who do it quite a bit, it looks like it really works. So. I kind of start, like if this is my mark right here, I'll start back here and I still align my foot right at the basket. I think that having that foot be aligned the same way every time leads to a lot of consistency. Because I see a lot of people who, you know, they might not pay that much attention, they just step up. But your whole body is sort of based on how that leg is aligned. So if you can build consistency in by having it be aligned the same way every time, it's really going to help you work your putts 
you know, because if you miss in a consistent way, it's easy to make a consistent correction to that, and hopefully you can line it up right in the, in the bucket. But, so I'll start back here, kind of take one step, and then before my foot comes up, I'm releasing up high and <coughs> extending. On that note, is there a rule of thumb when you choose your distance between whether I should just firmly cut or do a jump cut? Uh, there's not really a rule of thumb. I'm, I'm kind of one of these players that, um, for example, if I'm walking and I throw a shot and I'm, we're walking to the hole with the group, someone might ask me, like, are you going to run that putt? You know, give it a good run to make it. And, I think that that's not really wise to think about until you get over the putt and you're looking at it and you kind of tell how you feel. Because if you go into a putt and you say, well, I'm definitely going to run this, and then you get there and you feel a little bit of wind, you might be conflicted in your thoughts, like thinking, well, I was going to run it, but I don't really feel like it. And then you might do a half committed. You're not really committed to your putt. And that can lead to trouble because you could hit the cage and roll away. Um, but getting back to the original question of rule of thumb, you know, if I'm outside of 10 meters and and I'm really going to go for it and there's not a headwind, I think in a headwind I'm probably not going to jump out as much. In a headwind I'm going to really just focus on getting the, the glide just right with a lot of spin. Um, so I don't think there is a real rule of thumb. I like to wait till I'm over the putt see how I feel, see what's working that day, and then make a decision. I don't like to, I don't like to get too far ahead of myself. Does so, that answer your question at all? Or? Yeah. Okay. So if a certain shot is working for you on Friday and not working for you on a Saturday, will you, will I will you abandon, it, abandon go, it in a heartbeat? Yeah, go with what's working. I definitely believe that's a good philosophy to have. I have a question on headwinds or crosswinds. Mm -hmm. uh, do you power down or power up your putts when you've got wind coming from beside you or in front? Well, basically for that, I, I tend to, I, I imagine the disc in the air. And if you putt with a lot of hyzer and you've got a crosswind, basically you got to almost like just do the physics. If the air's coming this way and it hits the bottom of the disc, it's going to lift it up. If if, the, if you putt with an Anheuser and you got a wind coming this way, it's going to really push it down. Um, Nate Doss actually told me a long time ago, we were uh, playing and it was windier in Santa Cruz than it usually is. And I said, well, Nate, what do you, how, how do you make the, you know, what do you do if you got a crosswind like that? And he just simply said, I adjust for it. So you, you do kind of have to learn like, okay, how is wind going to affect my disc with this angle versus this angle? And this angle versus this angle, but once you do that, it's it's better to, to just kind of figure it out on the fly and, and kind of have an idea of what's going on, than to be locked into anything and just kind of mechanically go after it. So um, you can do a lot of that with practice, you know, just experimenting. And I don't really, I tend to probably power down a little bit in the wind. I don't. I want to, you know, like, if I'm 40 feet away on a windy day, I want to make sure I get my next shot in. I'm not as worried about making the shot as I am about not giving away a stroke. Because I'm a player who basically thinks that not bogeying is the same as birdie. So I try to not give that many ways, give too many strokes away. I try to keep the ones that I've earned. Anything else? Can you turn your putter over and show us how you grip your putter? Sure. I basically grip almost all my shots the same way. It's kind of, uh, I definitely wrap my index finger around the inside and it's kind of a stacked grip. The pinky touches first and then these grips, or these, these fingers all sort of stack on top of the pinky. And for putting, I try to keep a relatively loose grip. I don't like to grip too hard. Um, but there is something called the finger spring that I learned from uh, Dave Feldberg. And it's kind of, uh, once you wrap these fingers around here, anytime you, you move and release the disc like this, it imparts a little bit of spin on the disc. And that extending of your fingers gives the disc 
sort of a consistent release off of, I try to always have my palm on the disc because that's like a very solid fundamental spot for to generate power from and the fingers are a little more inconsistent so if you the more you can attach the disc to the larger muscles and bones in your in your body the more consistency you're going to have in your stroke anything else for your drives is your grip essentially the same or? i do keep a very similar grip um, mid ranges and putters it's pretty much all um, more of like this kind of a, it's not a fan grip, but I think it's called a fork grip. Yeah. Because I like to have a lot of control of the flight plate. And when I switch to a power grip, like you could, you can move the disc around a lot easier in my hand. Yeah. On, on this kind of a plane, when I'm in a power grip versus if I have more of a stack grip, I have a lot of control over that flight plate. On, on your release, uh do you more just let it go, or do you <coughs> sort of, uh, like more with the wrist, flip it off the end of your finger to get the snap on it? Yeah. Uh, a hard pop, or is it just so there's kind of a gentle thing? Yeah, there's kind of um, different players that have different philosophies about that. I'm definitely someone who likes to utilize a coiling of my wrist uh -huh. around the disc, so that when it comes out, it's got more spin than it would have if I kept my wrist firm. So, I kind of, my game is a little more suited to hitting lines than it is for getting power. And if you really want power, you're going to have to have your grip, a power grip, yeah. with your fingers wrapped around so that you're actually contacting the rim on the tips of your fingers. Okay. That's where you get the really elastic motion in your hand. Is that a full all for release at the same time, all four fingers, or does it come off? I'm not a I'm not an expert in the power grip, so yeah. I don't know if I, can, I there might be some here, but I have a hard time with the power grip. Every time I, I try it, I crank it right. Crank it right. You know, so, it right. Yeah, yeah. So actually, when I was I learned a little bit about it. Dave Feldberg again. I attended one of his clinics, and he would get us in this in this motion, and I tend to keep the disc flat on my backswing. Yeah. And when I was learning the power grip, he said, no, you're going to need hyzer because when it comes out, it is going to tend to have more spin, more power, and it's going to flip quicker. So either, you know, find a middle point for the grip while you're learning it, and also try having more hyzer when you bring it back. Set it up in its alignment that you want to have as it releases your hand right away. And that should help. So along those same lines, um, I know you guys aren't all beginners, but we are going to talk about rollers a little later. Um, I try to think about having my game all based around a flat level throw with a stable driver. And, you know, maybe five, ten feet off the ground. And what that does is it allows me to change discs to change the shape of the hole. So I'm trying to hit a fairway that turns to the right, I can throw my same basic shot and just change to an understable disc. Now when you get into something like a roller, no matter how understable a disc you have, if you release it flat, it's probably not going to have enough time to stand up and make it smoothly. So then what I do is I basically try to swing the same, but what I'll do is I'll lean my body back so that I, instead of turning around basically my spine which is in a vertical alignment I'll tilt it back like this so that I'm swinging like this and the disc already has the roller angle on it when I release it and another thing about rollers is I'm, I'm really really cocking my wrist around the disc so that when it releases it's like a top it just has so much spin that it really comes out hard really has a lot of spin and I like to visualize when I'm throwing rollers that the disc is actually going to speed up when it hits the ground so the revolu the rotation of the disc is going faster than it's moving forward and that really helps for a lot of consistency in your rollers when they land because if you land them and they are moving forward faster than the edge is spinning they kind of have to make a little correction and they might jump and go offline or something like that questions about any of that?
Well, what disc do you use to uh, figure out rollers? Rollers, I'm looking at a, either an understable mid-range or an understable driver. But it's got to be understable. You, you want to let the disc do the work for you. Um, I roll an Avenger SS and I roll a beat up um, DX Aftershock. It's kind of like a Cobra or Stingray. Um, and I see a lot of people trying to roll like, I don't know, like maybe um, discs that just aren't understable enough and they'll go out and they'll hit and then they'll cut and they just won't really work that well. Whereas if that person would just take a less stable disc and you can start with something like a uh, Stingray or a Cobra that's really old and you might think doesn't have any use to it. And that's going to be one of your better roller discs. Something really old and beat up that turns really well. Also good for straight low air shots if you want to put a, a hyzer flip kind of thing on it. What's the angle that you want the disc to hit at? on the ground as opposed to... Uh, I'd say average is probably about 45, 45. degrees, okay. somewhere around there. It kind of depends on how far you want it to go, how much it turns, um, how beat up it is. But you definitely want it to land with some angle. Now you can control the distance. If, if you have a roller that isn't that long, you can lean back even more and have it land almost vertically and then it'll start its turn really quick. But what a lot of people have a hard time actually leaning back enough to get that to happen. But when you do, it's a good way to control the distance. Um, then you could take, you know, if you have really hard ground like the infield there, you can throw a stable disc like a, you know, an eagle or, or a rogue, something that doesn't have as much turn but give it a lot more power and a lot more speed, and it will cut for a long way before it starts its turn. Now that the trade-off is sometimes it isn't gonna stand all the way up if you don't have that just right, but the potential to go a greater distance is higher with a more stable disc. Anything else? When do you decide that you should roll it? Basically, if, look like? if it's your only option, <laughs> it, you know, if there's no other way you can get to it, then that's probably a good a good time. Or if you don't have any obstructions and the grass is cut really low, um, rollers will tend to go about 10% farther than air shots will. Uh, I read that a long time ago, and it seems to be pretty true. Like on a I can throw a 400 foot air shot with a lot of discs, and I can probably throw a 450 foot roller. So that's about 10% more. But also, it, it finishes the opposite way that a hyzer will. So if you don't have a good sidearm, you could actually learn a backhand roller, and if you can, it'll turn to the right. You know, it, it'll open up some different shaped shots or different shaped fairways for you that you might not normally have. So uh, I could go, we could go, I could just do some examples out here real quick if you want. Um, so here I have a couple of entered SS's. And a beat up, um, this is a DX Aftershock. So this one's not going to go as far, but it's a good... It'll do most of the work for me. And I gotta check the wind first. It looks like I'm gonna be thrown right into the wind. So with this disc, I can actually release it pretty much flat. And it should turn right over. And if I'm sort of aiming out towards that basket, it'll finish back around by the uh, by first base or, or maybe out towards right field. But what, if, you, if you can pick up in my hand, I really cock my wrist a lot to try to generate as much spin as possible. Didn't turn over quite as fast as I thought it was the head You can see it, it really doesn't require all that much effort. Now I'm going to go up to a beat up Avenger SS. And I can give this one, I can throw this one pretty level too, with a little bit of Anheuser. You can 
See, if you had a fairway that was shaped like that, I can't throw a sidearm nearly that far. So it really opens up a lot of opportunities. And then I'll show you, if, if you were to have a more stable disc, this is a squall. I'll really accentuate the mean back. And so I'll be giving the disc almost all the angle that it needs right out of my hand. And it'll still go probably almost as far, although it's not quite as fast as those others. When you throw these rollers, what's making the disc turn is it still has those same aerodynamic tendencies that it has when it's flying in the air. An understable disc wants to lift the edge that's going into the wind. And so when it lands on the ground, it still has that lift, but the lift is, is, is kind of leveraged with the ground, so it's just going to stand up. So if you have a really overstable disc, it's going to react the same way on the ground as it does in the air. And it's going to, see that one's not going to turn over, it's just going to cut the other way. So you can really tailor the disc that you use a lot to the kind of shape of the shot that you're trying to throw. What do you use for big distance rollers? I am usually using a Rogue. It's a little faster, but still has a little bit of understability. And I can get it out there a lot farther before it hits the ground and still have it turn over. But you could use any any faster disc that has a little bit of understability. Would be my recommendation. And when you go to slower discs like the Rogue compared to the Avenger, it's a little bit slower and it'll be more consistent. And I always try to go with heavier discs because they tend to roll more consistently and get through obstacles better. Um, so I'd recommend whatever you know heavier on your range. If you typically only throw up to 160, then Maybe try 165 or something like that. Um, any other questions on rollers? If you have a strong headwind, would you rather throw an air shot or a roller if you didn't have anything you're with? Wide open. Okay. Say, Depends. Say 30, 35 mile an hour headwind. I would probably tend to throw an air shot with a stable disc. Rollers. You know, they're great, but they are not always as predictable as, you know, a stable disc into the wind. Um, but they, if you get them right, they, they can go farther. So it's a little bit of a trade-off there. Your footwork stays the same on all your drives, whether it's a roller or air shot? Actually, for rollers, I think a roller's like kind of extreme Anheuser's. So when I'm throwing a, uh, an Anheuser shot, stay straight this way towards that basket. Um, if I'm throwing a straight shot, I mean, I'm going to have a relatively straight approach right down the middle of the pad. And if I want to throw an Anheuser, I'm going to start back on the back right corner and approach the tee pad this way. Because then I'm, I'm already sort of leaning back as I'm coming into it. And if I'm throwing a hyzer, I want to approach it from this side, and it kind of makes my spine angle lean a little bit forward, and then it's the same kind of like from here up, it's almost the same, but I'm leaning a little bit forward and I'm releasing with a high angle. So I shape my approach to the tee box to mimic the shape of the shot that I want to throw. Any uh, other questions? Oh no, you were waving a bug. Yeah. <laughs> so what if you like, um, you have a, let's say for instance, tee off 15, that's kind of straight and then you go to the right, and uh, how like, how would you want to throw like, you know, how fast or I guess how medium of throw would you want to throw it, like, speed wise? It's shorter. Shorter. Yeah, it's shorter. A short, quick anhyzer? Yeah, it's like straight and then cut right. So what I try to do in those situations is uh, shorten my run up if it's a shorter shot I will I'll actually I can throw relatively far 
with just standing still and rocking my weight back and forth. So if it was like if I had to turn around here and maybe get I don't know close to that backstop, I would take a relatively understable disc. I probably wouldn't wouldn't really need a run up. I might take like one step. But I'd really focus on the angle that I wanted it to release at. And something else I always do that uh, I see some people don't is I will actually hold the disc up at the angle I want to release it and I'll visualize it going all the way to the hole. And I do that because I found that, I don't know if it's subconscious or conscious, but my brain really kind of wants to know the whole path to the target. And if I don't rehearse it, like if I'm trying to go through trees and I just sort of say, okay, I'm just going to throw and try to get through there, I won't execute the shot. I'll usually end up hitting a tree or something. So if I actually pick, you're faced with an impossible window, I feel it's really important to pick the exact path that you want to fly on to give your brain something to, to chew on, basically. And I find when I do that, I may not always execute it, but at least I'll know, okay, I missed that shot low, or I missed it high, and I'll be able to say, okay, next time I throw this shot, well, I missed it low or I missed it high last time, and I'll be able to make an adjustment. But if it, it's just a quick little hand riser, I won't really take much run up. Just Choosing a really understable disc. Yeah. Is that, that kind of? Yeah, that helps. Okay. Hey John, can I give you a shot real quick? Yeah. Hey, if you guys are planning on staying around and playing the draw doubles and you haven't signed up, this is your last chance to do so. I'm going to start breaking the cards down. So if you're going to get in and stay, go ahead and check out Danielle. She'll help you out. Sorry. That's all right. We'll be about another 10, 12 minutes. We're good to go. So if any of you have like uh, other questions you want to ask me personally, come on up or if you want to see me do a certain shot, now's a chance. John Baldwin, thanks for visiting yeah, Disc Golf, Arkansas.